Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is the Community Culture and Heritage Grant Workshop for Humanities DC, where we'll go into depth in this particular grant opportunity. My name is Loy Namard. I'm the Director of Grant Making and Programs at Humanities DC. I've been on board since April of last year. Uh, normally, there'd be two of us on these workshops on staff. There's only one, so I'm going to be trying to watch the chat and see if anyone's entering the, the room, the waiting room at the same time, but we should be okay. So we can go ahead and get started. Um, outline for this, our time together, we'll start with introductions to get a sense of who's in the room and what people are thinking about for their projects. Uh, touch on the purpose of this workshop, talk about what humanities Humanities DC is all about, and then delve into the community culture and heritage grants, talk about the application process, and then end with Q&A and give folks the opportunity if they would like to talk about their ideas for their proposals. So <clears throat> the purpose of this workshop is to provide more detail about this particular grant opportunity to highlight key aspects of the application. We won't be going into detail into everything that's required. So you definitely will wanna to refer to the RFP and the application instructions. And we also did an overview uh, workshop that went through all of the grants and talking about some of the technical details of all the grants, giving folks an opportunity to compare the different grant opportunities. So you're welcome to check that out as well. We will have by the end of this week, a recording of that and a presentation will be on the website. And this workshop also gives applicants, prospective applicants, the opportunity to discuss their ideas if they would like, not in a great deal of detail, but to get their ideas out there and um, get some reaction to what they're thinking about. So let's start with, um, if you could each tell us a little bit of just a little bit about yourself, your name, your organization affiliation, if any, and 30 seconds on your project idea and your interest in it um and you can just anyone who wants to to speak can and if you'd be more comfortable putting in the chat that's fine as well uh hi everyone i'll start okay. um good evening everyone my name is joy jones i'm affiliated with banneker ballroom dance club they're historically black uh ballroom 501c3 that's been around since um, after World War II, uh, interested in possible funds for a documentary project. Nice to be here with everybody. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Hi, I'm Sue Breikoff with Woodley House. Um, Woodley House um, provides housing and services for adults in the district with mental health disorders. And we are celebrating our 65th year this year and are kind of looking at ways that we can um, kind of provide more information for how mental health and housing, you know, is important in DC and how, you know, it has changed over time. So kind of looking at a way to record that through oral histories or, um, you know, video and and the like. Wonderful. Are you also paying attention to the oral history opportunity? Um, well, I just saw that all of the opportunities today. So okay. I'm just jumping on that. Just, you know, maybe oral history, not entirely sure what that will look like. So wanted to see if this was the right opportunity. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Hello. Give me my, my name is Fred Winter. I'm with Dacor Bacon House. It's an organization of retired federal employees who've been involved in international studies and, and programs. Um, we have a headquarters building on the edge of um, downtown and Foggy Bottom that's celebrating its 200th anniversary in 2025. It was a um, private mansion that was closely connected to the political elite in Washington in the 19th century. Um, in anticipation of the anniversary, we've done a lot of research on the enslaved workers who built and helped maintain the house in the 19th century. And we are thinking about using the, um, the Heritage Grant to build pre-college um, pre and college level curricula looking at the role of enslaved labor in the non-federal components of Washington in the earlier 19th century. So getting away from the, the workers who built the White House and built the Capitol into the workers who built and maintained 
the life of the elite in Washington during the the early federal era. Interesting. Thank you. My name is Jerry Huntley. I live in D.C. I founded a nonprofit that helps communities and organizations tell their oral histories in a new way. Online, quick, they just look like videos, but they're really audio. And uh, we started a couple of years ago and we are now in nine states. And I feel like it's about time I do it in DC where I've lived for 43 years. We have a unique idea working with another organization that we're hoping to use this methodology for in DC. I won't give the idea quite yet. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? I can go next. Um, I'm Janelle Legg. Uh, I'm a project manager at the uh, Shookman Center, the Deaf Documentary Center here at Gallaudet University. Uh, and we've been doing some narrative history interviews um, with deaf community members in, in DC and nationally. And we're interested in seeing what we could do uh, locally and at Gallaudet. Great. I can go. Um, my name's Patty Rose, and I'm the executive director of the Perry School Community Services Center. And uh, we uh, have an incredible history. Originally, the school was the M Street uh, High School, uh, either the first or one of the very first uh, publicly funded high schools for African Americans in the country. And it was Dunbar's predecessor, but very few people know about it. So we're uh, trying to uh, get funding to explore uh, that legacy of the students, faculty, and administrators um, in a variety of uh, creative and artistic ways. And uh, we'd like to do something along those lines. Interesting, thank you. Anyone else? So I am Paulette Jones Bell Iman. And uh, I am doing this as an individual, um, but I am currently a sky meditation teacher. Uh, I have been teaching meditation uh, in the Washington DC area for 50 years, I think to to the African American community, I think it's a kind of uh, it's a legacy, and I'd like to tell that story because it has led to me finding uh, being the founder of two schools and um, currently working to bring a world cultural festival here to help with bringing more peace to the city. Great, thank you. Anyone else want to go? Sure. My name is Lee Player. I'm with Horton's Kids. We are an out of school time provider serving kids and families in Ward 8. Um, we recently partnered with an organization called In a Perfect World Foundation that has provided us with a media lab. The kids are loving it and um, they want to tell their stories. So um, we are new to the humanity space. So I just wanted to come here and learn and see um, what might be possible. Wonderful. Hi, I'm Marisa Terrell. I'm with the High T Society. We're a, a life skills program, and I'm I'm not certain that my, our project fits into the category. So I was trying to better understand. We are um, trying to uh, teach critical thinking by for for high school girls to help them make better decisions in real time. And so what that means is we are. Um, Vi like they're creating videos where they are serving as peer counselors to explain different scenarios that have happened with them so that they can educate their peers on ways to, um, we're not going to call them mistakes, we're going to call them missed opportunities, sharing missed opportunities with their peers uh, after research, um, that group research to try to help 
you know, other students learn vicariously through them. I don't know if that fits because the definition for humanities to me is, is a bit unclear um, because it's not an oral history. It's more of what is going on in their lives right now and um, how they can communicate that in, in, a, in a unique way to encourage other girls to um, pause before they leap into the unknown. <laughs> Okay. So at the end of this, um, if you are still trying to figure that out, we can set up a one-on-one -on -one with one of our staff to talk it through some more. Okay. Thanks. A couple other people, and then feel free to put your information in the chat and share it that way if you'd like. Hi, I'm Ming Lo with Neighborhood Associates, and we're all about building public kinship and celebrating community, particularly among affordable housing residents in the District of Columbia. Thank you. Hi, I'm Martrice Watson from Gallaudet University. Um, we are looking to preserve oral histories from our Black Deaf community. We have um, history that has not been recorded. It's been generation to generation and we're looking for ways to preserve because they are aging out and we wanna make sure that we have that history to pass on to generation to generations. We have um, stories that have impacted nationwide. Um, we have the deaf family, the Miller family who had a lawsuit against the Board of Education that sparked Brown versus Board of Education. And we are trying to navigate the preservation of their legacy. Okay, great. Okay, well, thank you. And feel free if you didn't get an opportunity to share to add it in the chat so we can learn more about you. So about Humanities DC, for those who aren't familiar, we help all Washingtonians deepen their relationship with the city and each other through the sharing of stories, fostering intellectual stimulation, and promoting cross-cultural understanding. And um, we do it through two ways, community-informed grant making to invest in local scholars, community experts, and organizations, as well as engaging residents through partnership-based public programming. In terms of this particular grant opportunity, it had a slightly different name last year, but we awarded six grants last year. And this year we expect to award $80,000 to eight in to eight grantees. So the Community Culture and Heritage Grants, um, just to say a little bit about why they make sense for us and why we're excited about them. It expands the support that we provide to the humanities beyond scholars and historians. While formal 501c not 501c3 nonprofit organizations are eligible. This is a grant where we welcome individuals and community organizations who have want to tell stories of interest to them to document the history, culture, and narratives of DC and hopefully highlight forgotten or little known aspects of DC. An overview of the grant is um, preserving the culture, memories, and experiences of DC, capturing unfolding stories. So can be from history to the current time. And the, there's a range of possibilities about how that might um, take place based on what you as a potential grantee have in mind. But some examples are written publications, multimedia projects, exhibits, websites, lesson plan, tours. As you can see, there's a wide range of what that might look like. A few examples from last year, and I should say that all a description of all of last year's grants are on our website. We're just redoing our website and gradually adding things to it. So hopefully over time we'll have more of a history, but for now the 2022 grants are there. And these are just four examples from last year's Community Heritage Grant. Um, a retrospective exhibit on the groundbreaking artists who painted the first murals east of the city east of the river, well, east of the city. And um, there, that was uh, um, in conjunction with an exhibition at the um, Mural Museum in DC. The Georgetown African-American Historic Landmark Project and Tour, plaques and other markers honoring the enslaved and free Afri African-Americans who lived in, worked in, and assisted in building Georgetown. So the funding we provided helped her to add some, some new plaques to those that she already have. 
a digital detective story where the public learned about the Fort Reno community, which is a black neighborhood that was displaced in favor of the park that is there now. And the DAP project, a multimedia project on the meaning and complexities of DAP, that hand gesture in three neighborhoods in DC. So that's just to give you a sense of the range that we had last year and to let you know that you can be creative about how you might, um, what you might come up with. Applicant eligibility. Eligible applicants are DC-based individuals who are at least 18 years of age, DC-based community groups, um, but a note that they must de designate a primary point of contact for the purpose of submitting the application and us knowing who um, is responsible and DC-based nonprofit organizations. It's also important to note that if you have a prior grant, it must be closed before submission. And if you're in that situation, you can talk about that more with one of our community grants managers. Fiscal sponsorship is an option for individuals and community groups that might be concerned about the tax or other implications of being the direct applicant themselves. And a fiscal sponsor is a 501c3 nonprofit that assumes all financial and legal obligations of the grant award. No more than 10% of a grant award may be used to pay a fiscal sponsor. Often they do ask for a fee and that's the, the limit in our grants. Requirements of the grant, um, there is a showcase of projects towards the end of the project period. Um, this project period this year ends in March, so likely it would take place in February, but towards the beginning of the grant, we would set a date that works for hopefully everyone. You're required to document all grant expenditures, any changes to the scope of the approved grant or budget, and there's a, a limit um, over which you need to request uh, approval. And an interim and final report is required. Um, there's a question whether a primary grant means from the DC Humanities Council from the district in general. And the, we'd be referring to um, the council uh, uh, us specifically. Up to $10,000 per award. If what you're proposing doesn't come to $10,000, you don't have to request $10,000, but that is the maximum. The full grant is awarded at the beginning of the project period, which is May 1st of this year through March 1st of next year. Any other questions so far? Okay. So um, turning to the, your proposal specifically, your application must have a humanities focus. The um, Somebody referenced the humanities, the definition of humanities, and it is interesting because it really, the only definitions that we tend to see are just listing the areas that fall under it. And the key areas for us are anthropology, archaeology, art history, criticism and appreciation, comparative religion, ethics, history, and jurisprudence, language, linguistics, literature, philosophy, and preservation. Your application must also have strong scholar or expert involvement. And that means a DC-based um, scholar, historian, or community expert with expertise in the focus of your application. And we wanna make it clear that it doesn't have to be a scholar or historian, that they could be a community member who has expertise in that particular area. Somebody asked a question about a community organization. Uh, we use that term to differentiate from a nonprofit, from a formal 501c nonprofit organization. So it's a community group or, or, or organization. Question? Mm -hmm. about the DC-based scholar? Uh -huh. Does that have to be someone who lives in the district or can it be someone who works or is affiliated with a group in the district but who lives in the, the surrounding suburban communities? Hmm. That is an interesting question. I'd have to think about that. If you wouldn't mind sending that in to us, I need to give that some thought. I mean, the that potentially could meet the intent um, 
So yeah, we need to give that some thought. Thanks for that question. Okay, thank you. I will follow up. Uh, your application must also demonstrate community partnership. In other words, how DC residents benefit from and are involved in the pro project. And there is a final product that comes out of your project and one that's accessible to DC residents in some way. Like I said, we will have an event where you get a chance to showcase it there, but in some other way, residents are able to view it or access it depending on what your project is. Some required elements to be aware of. Um, organizations must have a valid EIN or UEI number, and an organization meaning a 501c nonprofit. The UEI unique entity identifier replaces what previously was the DUNS number for the government. And um, it's now, they now use the UEI. That change was last year. Um, you must, so that's something that you'd want to apply for if you're representing a, a 501c organization. You don't technically need to have it at the time of application, but would, you would need to have it in order to receive funding. So it's best to go ahead and request that. And in the materials that we provide on our website, we provide a link that helps you um, go to that site, the federal government site to request that. You must have a physical address located in Washington, D.C., there is, you'll need to complete in the proposal organization profile or individual statement of interest, depending on when, it, whether it's an organization or individual. And really that's about demonstrating your connection to what you're proposing. You'll of course describe your activities and you'll wanna do that in a comp comprehensive manner that shows that what you're proposing to do will lead to whatever the desired end that you have described. You will list and talk about the key personnel of your project. And what you're doing there is demonstrating to the reviewers who will ensure that the project is successful. Taking a quick look at the questions. Okay, I'll answer those shortly. Um, other required elements, there'll be a project timeline required of you in your proposal. And uh, you will want to, as you're developing that, do it in such a way that it demonstrates to the reviewer that the timeline, the activities that you're proposing will result in a successfully completed project by the end of the project period. Your project budget and budget narrative will should be comprised of allowable costs, of course, and demonstrate they're sufficient to carry out the project. And you'll also talk about how you're gonna measure success. What does success mean to you and how will you know that you've achieved it? I'm gonna take a minute now to take a look at the questions. We do not have a thematic focus for this year's competition. We're interested in a wide range of supported projects. The only competition where we talked about some particular areas of interest is for DC Oral History. That one is a partnership, DC Oral History Collaborative. It's a partnership with the DC Public Library. And there are three topics in particular they're interested in to help um, enhance those areas in their archives. But for the other applications, there's no um, particular focus. In terms of the details of the actual application, um, suggested sections, et cetera. When you go on our website, there is a link to the list of application questions for each of the different um, grant programs. So you'll while you actually submit the application in Foundnet, which is our online system, we have a list of the application questions so you can see them in advance and work on your application um, outside of the system. So you can find that there. That's a good question about the external reviewers. So these are individuals, once again, based in DC who apply to be external reviewers. They essentially make the grant decisions in the sense that they review the applications, they make comments, they have an opportunity to, to speak together. We as staff facilitate that conversation, but we don't weigh in. Then they rank all of the proposals and provide comments. We then take what they have ranked and make a cutoff just based on the amount of funding that is available. And that's what we provide to our board of directors. Our board of directors then essentially 
bless, so to speak, the what they have proposed and they what they are proving really is that we have followed our outline procedures. So the grant reviewers, these community members really do um, help us make those final decisions. We don't particularly weigh in. These are individuals who are from the community who have a background in the different areas of the grant. So anyone can apply and we're accepting applications now and that information is, there's a link on our website that you will see. Uh, they can be past grant recipients and it's a great opportunity to understand the proposal and review process. And it's something that I highly recommend doing with us, if you're interested in grants from, from us in the future, but also with any grant maker, that um, is a great opportunity to understand more about the process. Um, is the money from a grant to an individual treated as an income to be reported to the IRS? Yes. And of course, I can't give much more advice than that because I don't have it and it wouldn't be appropriate. But that is why some folks um, might choose to go through another, through a nonprofit organization. But we do have many individuals that, that do apply directly. If he applies an individual, can the payment be paid as a contractor through a... Uh... Hmm. So, um... So you're saying we wouldn't make the payment to an entity different than the one that applied. So if that doesn't answer the question, please follow up with us after and we can delve deeper in your specific uh, situation. Any other questions before we move on? Yes, is it paid as a 1099? Yes. Let me just make sure I didn't accidentally, okay. Project costs, 100% of the awarded grant funds must be applied to direct program costs. So the project that you're applying for. So that uh, expenses can include product supplies and equipment, virtual presenting platforms, space rental, honoraria, wages, stipends, project transportation, pro project publicity and promotion, just to give you a few examples. The grant cannot fund indirect costs, overhead, rent, utilities, administrative fees, general office supplies rather than specific project supplies, uh, refresh, refreshments, et cetera. Some strategies for successful applications, and this is across the board. Break down the categories on the budget sheet into individual expenses on the budget narrative. So to give the reviewers an opportunity to, to truly understand the expenses that make up your budget. Clearly stating the goal of your project and how it will be achieved. Making clear the benefit your project will have on DC residents. Anticipating and answering questions reviewers might have. And a way to do that is to have someone on connected to the project review it, review your proposal and provide you feedback before submitting it. Um, do not include letters of support from organizations or individuals not directly involved in, in the project and connected to what you're proposing. Uh, it's not required to have letters of support at all, but if you do provide them, they need to be directly relevant to the project. And this might seem um, obvious, but to answer all the questions to the best of your ability and not skip questions, which folks sometimes do if they, for whatever reason. Resources available to you, live <laughs> workshops like the ones we're doing now, but also the workshop recordings and presentations we will have on our website. The RFP, you will want to review that closely for the particular grant opportunity you're interested in. And um, the application questions, like I mentioned before, for each of the grant opportunities, we created a Word document with all the questions for your review. Frequently asked questions document, as well as tips on using Foundant or, Foundant or application portal. That uh, document, the Foundant tips, that should be up on our website next week. And then office hours, you will see a link on the website to sign up for one-on-one 30-minute -on -one assistance calls. 
There's a link for Jasper, who is specifically our senior manager for the DC Oral History Collaborative, and then another link for Eli, who manages a point of contact for all the other grant opportunities. You can also just send an email to either of them um, directly. Key links and contacts for this particular opportunity, that's the link to our website where the grant opportunities are, or if you just go on our website, you'll see where it says grants. If you click on that, there's a, a grant opportunities page, which has a table with all the opportunities. And from there, you can go to the one that you're interested in. This is a link to, the second one is a link to Foundant which is the portal that you submit your applications in. But once you, again, on the website, you'll have a direct link to it there. Eli Youssef, a community grants manager, that's his email address. And I have my contact information there as well. How to submit the application. When you are ready to begin, you go to Foundant, what I mentioned before. You'll create a new profile for you and your organization if this is your first time applying for Humanities DC grant. If it is not in the RFP, it should be, if it isn't obvious to you when you're going into Foundant in the RFP, we have a little bit more detail about that. You do not want to create a new profile if either you or your organization already have a profile in the system. Click on apply when you're at your applicant dashboard, and then you'll see a list of all the grant opportunities and you'll select the one that you're most interested in. So um, now uh, I want to have an opportunity for folks to ask questions, and I think I have an additional one in the chat. Do the budgets for these grants often include cost sharing and does cost sharing? Uh, so um, it there is no match requirement. Some folks do add additional costs for the grant in to their application, and we like seeing that. It doesn't increase the positive imp impressions for the reviewers have, but it is helpful to get a scope of the full project uh, budget that's going to support what you're proposing. What if you don't know where the organization has applied in the past? That is a great question. Um, you can contact us and we can look that up for you. So what are the questions do we have? And is there anyone who wants to talk a little bit about what they're thinking about? Um, so this is Joy Jones again. Um, I was too slow in the chat. So I'll, I'll just ask in front of the group. Um, two questions, basic ones. I'm just confirming this is the proper grant if we're interested in doing a video slash documentary. You can, but Visions um, in, is another opportunity for you. And so you want to take a look at that as well, because that has um, a higher limit. Okay, that was that was going to be my related question. Because um, mm -hmm. as if anyone has explored film and video here, the expenses are, are relatively high. Uh, and then I had a more sort of baseline question. Um, Banneker Ballroom, and I should also clarify, I'm, I'm affiliated with them, not a board member, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, Banneker is a volunteer organization, which doesn't have a fixed permanent physical address. Mm -hmm. So then what qualifies as the address? Do they need a physical location? Could it be you know, registered agent uh, since they have their 501c3 paperwork? Um, yeah, if you could speak a little bit about- yeah, It could be the board, it could be the board. It can't be a PO box. It could be the board chair, so it could be some, or the, um, do you have a volunteer ED or? Yes. Okay, so it could be that person as well. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, so regarding the documentaries there, people have done documentaries under this grant. There was one just last year on Lee's, the historic Lee's flowers. Um, but yes, the, we all, we've in the past had a separate documentary grant and because we just wanted to simplify the number of grants we had that's folded under vision. So visions, projects, and events, you'll want to take a look at that one. Thank you much. You're welcome. Reporting and meeting requirements. Um, there's an interim and final report. There probably will be a couple of 
we'll do an initial meeting with everyone at the very beginning of the grant. And there'll probably be a couple of meetings towards the end as we plan for the showcase. And then beyond that, your grants manager will likely check in with you, particularly around the progress report review time. And you're welcome to check in with them at any time as well. Other questions or ideas and thoughts? Uh, this is Joy Jones again. Um, I guess my question, any, you talked about best practices, but any common mistakes that first time grantees make? So in other words, things not to do, you just wouldn't mind repeating for me since this will be a new, or this will be a new, this will be Banneker's first time applying for grants at this point. Oh, for grants at all. That's correct. Okay. Um, I think what people, the, I would say the most common mistake is not being thorough and making assumptions either for some people it's just based on um, they think that you'll understand this organization or understand what we're about. So just make no assumptions. Assume that the folks reading your application know nothing about your issue area, about your organization, about what you're about. So being as thorough as possible and having somebody external to your organization and project idea reading the proposal and giving you feedback. I just put a question in the chat. I'm just trying to, I've got a, if I apply as an individual, mm -hmm. right, you only need a social security number and like an address, right? You don't need, um, the fiscal sponsor is optional. Is, is optional. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you apply before as an entity, uh, that, if you apply before as an entity, then that you have to make sure if you apply as an entity again that your final report is submitted. But if you're applying as an individual that's not related to that entity, it's two separate things. Is that correct? Yes and no. If it's if it's clear that there's a connection, we mm -hmm. might look into it a little bit and kind of make sure that you at least are in good standing with the other proposals, the same key people, then we'd want to, we would take that into consideration. Okay. Um, I'm trying to remember which grant y'all had before. We did the events one. Um, it was high That's tech right. as, yeah. as events. And I'm I'm thinking now that I've heard what this is, I think what my initial um project might not work for this, but I have an, another one that might that might. And so I'm mm -hmm. thinking, but that's a definite individual that has no relationship to that um organization. Okay. And that's why I was trying to figure out if it could be paid as an individual, because, you know, for tax purposes, you're trying to get paid. If you're an individual, you're trying to get paid through your, through something. Mm -hmm. I have that large chunk of money go straight into your account. Mm -hmm. and I was, that's what I was trying to figure out before like, yeah. um, when you pay out. It, yeah, it has to go to the entity that applied the individual or the nonprofit that applied okay. either on their that applied on their behalf or for itself. OK, so I sent you an email already. Hoping OK talk because I, I think I'm a bit confused and I want to clarify okay. before I yeah, jump. No in. problem. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, hi, I have a question. Um, thank you, first of all, for um, uh, providing uh, the context behind this grant. Um, so I guess kind of lifting up what has been put in the chat and really trying to get down to the bottom of, I actually put in the chat, like how do you define a community organization? Mm -hmm. So if it's not an individual or a 501c, 501c3, then what is that third option? Is it a community organization that is an, L an LLC, uh, S4? It's, it's an, it's, I would say it's more of an informal organization. They don't have the 501c3 status. So it could be a neighborhood group. It could be just some other organization the community that doesn't have formal 501c3 status okay if they what if they're a community so a community organization is divine as a group of people and they don't have 
pretty much an entity. Is that what I'm hearing? It's a group of people that have um, some type of focus and purpose, but wow. they don't have 501c3 status. So this is just an opportunity um, for groups that don't have that formal status to still participate in our in our grants. Got it. Thank you for clarifying. Oh, sure. Also, I might have missed this. Are, will the slides be shared or will they be part of resources on the website? Some of yes, them? they will. Okay. Um, we're in, as I said, we're in the middle of updating our website. So there's a lot going on. So if we don't get it up quickly enough, just send us an email and we'll send it out to you. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Well, if there are no further questions for now, this is not your final opportunity. Please reach out to us, check out the resources on the website. Let us know if you have additional questions. And if you're not sure if this is the right opportunity, look at um, the other opportunities and workshops on the website. There's visions, projects, and events, which is somewhat of a catch-all. There's a DC Oral History Collaborative. If you're interested in oral histories, either conducting your own oral histories or going into our archives and not our archives, archives at the DC Public Library or some other archive you might be aware of, finding an oral history of interest and doing a public event on that oral history. Youth in the Humanities is a new grant for us as general operating support for youth organizations that are humanities focused. And then in cycle two, we will have our capacity building grant. And hopefully I did not miss one. Um, and festivals and gatherings and DC docs, which used to be separate opportunities are now under visions, projects and events. Just double checking the questions. Great. Well, thank you all for your interest and let us know if we can be helpful. Take care. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks, have a great night. Thank you too.